and welcome. My name is Mrs. Brown and I teach Washington State History at Robert Eagle Staff Middle School in the Seattle Public Schools. And so welcome to my unit. We're over the next uh, few days, we're going to be taking a look at what it means to be a land-based people. And I come from land-based people. I'm descended from Yakima, Snohomish, Stillaguamish, Muckleshoot, Snoqualmie, Puyallup, and I am a land-based person. I didn't even know it. Uh, but I most closely identify with my Yakima heritage because I was born and raised on the Yakima Reservation in Wapato and Toppenish, Washington, so welcome. So we are going to explore what it means to be a land-based people. And the reason why we're doing that is in order to understand Washington state history, you need to understand the land beneath your feet and what it means, not just to the non-Indian settlers who then become citizens of Washington, but to the first peoples here who have been here since time immemorial, so welcome. Um, by the time we're done today, you should be able to explain the four principles of land-based peoples. And you are going to need something to write with and something to write on. If you were able to get a packet from one of the meal sites, that's great. If you were able to download it, that's great. If you just have a piece of paper, that's great too. My question for you right now to ponder is, would you rather dominate the environment or would you rather be part of the environment? And it seems like a trick question because everyone wants to be in charge, right? Um, well, the answer isn't quite that simple. When we take a look at the importance of land to land-based people, we have to first take a look at uh, the land originally. So this is a language map and it shows the various language groups throughout the Northwest, which we can also, um, we can also attribute to, the, uh, to tribes as well. And so we have complete presence reduced to this. So the land base was reduced uh, significantly, drastically, tragically. And we have to think about what that means to land-based people. Is it just losing real estate? Is it just having to move? Um, we will explore that today. Right here is a map of the traditional homelands in Washington state. Now, it's important for you to realize that these borders were, um, were defined by our treaties. For the federal government to be able to come in and negotiate treaties in exchange for millions and millions of acres of land, the federal government first had to define who lived where, which was kind of a weird concept. To, uh, to our leaders at the time because there was no one place where Yakima were. There was no one place where, um, where the Walla Walla were. And, uh, and so for the purposes of this paper, these were the traditional home, um, homelands as they were assigned. Now you see a lot of unassigned homelands. Um, that doesn't mean nobody lived there. That just quite simply means that, that those areas were not defined in treaties. Uh, in the in the eight treaties that were signed uh, in the treaty era of 1854 and 1855. So, <sighs> land-based people, there are two ways to see the world. Uh, over here we have a picture of a tribal man who is at a fishery, managing the fishery, caring for a single fish. Over here we have a non-Indian commercial fisherman sitting on a pile of fish. Now, what is the purpose of this person versus the purpose of this person? And I'm going to argue this person is looking for profit. This person certainly is probably looking to make a living, but also with land-based people, there is a responsibility that is tied to the land that this person right here does not feel. So again, I said that there are two ways of seeing the world and I'm going to define them loosely in two ways. First, there's land-based values, and then there are Judeo-Christian land values, and I'll explain what that is. First of all, with land-based values, humans are part of the ecosystem. You see that right here. With Judeo-Christian land values, humans control the ecosystem, and that's because each of their gods tell them to do so. So with land-based values, uh, the creator commands uh, people to care for and be stewards of the land. And we call that land 
Sinwitki, all life on earth. And uh, some also call this the covenant or the sacred promise with the creator. Well, that is markedly different from, uh, from what the Judeo-Christian God says. In his sacred text, uh, in fact, he commands that humans have dominion over the earth, over the fish of the sea and over the fowl and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And that's in the first book of the Bible. And so um, you can see the stark difference in the two ways that uh, these groups of people see the world. For example, also with Judeo-Christian land values, uh, this worldview exploits the environment. This world value respects and protects the environment. Land-based values also focus on the future and Judeo Christian land values, they focus on the present, what I can get from the land and its resources right now, just like that man with, you know, sitting on the big pile of fish. And so this is a, this is a really complicated concept. And so what I am going to do is work through some vocabulary with you. So please bear with me. So the first <clears throat> vocabulary word that's in your packet, there are only two, but they're pretty big, is symbiosis. And symbiosis is an adjective and it talks about it, it is the relationship between two different kinds of living things that live together and then they depend on each other and so i thought of the when you see in in nature videos where you see the hippopotamus and then the birds that are all on top of them you know um preening them and and pulling pulling various bugs and stuff off of them well they have what's called a symbiotic relationship the hippo gives the birds food, right? Because the birds are taking all those bugs. And, um, and then the bird provides a service to the hippo, making sure that the hippo is clean, healthy, and comfortable. And so that's an example of a symbiotic relationship or two species living in symbiosis. Um, a synonym might be interdependent or interconnected. And so we are gonna be using that word symbiosis throughout the course of these lessons. So if you did not have a packet, you might wanna jot down this information. It will come up again later. So if you don't get everything here, that's okay. Uh, just don't worry. As long as you can understand the concept right now, that's what I'm concerned with. So the next thing, the next vocabulary word is the purpose of our whole lesson today, to find out what land-based values mean. And as I said earlier, it's complicated. It's so complicated and different tribes are going to define and use different words to define their land-based values. For the purposes of our understanding, a very basic understanding, I boiled it down to four concepts that we're gonna be taking a look at here. And so, um, <clears throat> so first of all, a definition of being land-based. It's an adjective phrase. It's the relationship that indigenous people have traditionally had with their homeland since time immemorial. And there are four basic principles and we're gonna go over and unpack what those are. First is that the land teaches the people about relationships with each other. That the land also provides knowledge. It provides knowledge about science, technology, commerce, religion, uh, art, literature, <clears throat> and, um, and it also um, helps us understand our place in the world. Uh, people practice stewardship. We mentioned that earlier. Stewardship of the land, that is a sacred responsibility. And then finally, the land and the people exist in symbiosis. And so we'll be unpacking that even further. So an example here is uh, despite the impact of non-Indians and their um, on their homelands, the tribes of the Pacific Northwest always have always been and will continue to be land-based people. This is their world. This is how we see the world. And I couldn't find any synonyms. I couldn't come up with any synonyms for such a difficult concept. And so I just thought I would point that out for you. So let's unpack what each of these four principles mean. So the first is the relationships with each other. And, um, and when you are land-based people, you observe nature and you see how nature is successful and, um, and thriving. And so you're going to emulate a system that works, right? And so, um, so the land teaches us how to cooperate, how to have patience, how to trust, how to give, among many other things. But when we take a look at what happens when species cooperate and wait and trust, 
that the next thing is going to happen and also to give in a symbiotic way, then we see something uh, that is balanced and healthy. The next uh, principle is knowledge. Uh, how the world works, how it sustains life, how, how things grow and heal, and the cyclical nature of life itself. And, um, and a really simple way to uh, think about this is in terms of what the land teaches us and what we observe. And so what I mean by teaching is this. I told you I grew up in the Yakima Valley and our sacred mountain, Pato, um, it was renamed much, much later uh, Mount Adams, but its original name is Pato, um, which means a mountain with a white cap, which is exactly what it is, right? Um, <clears throat> we use our mountain, the mountain teaches us when huckleberry season is, is, is upon us. And so if you take a look at the mountain in the winter time right here where I've outlined, there is there's something that to us looks like a horse. So you see that right there and um, and when late summer rolls around and it changes because of the snow melt right um, you're going to see what happens if um, there are a couple of ways to look at it some people think that that the horse is bucking off a rider and others think that the horse's head is tilting down they see different things I wonder what you see uh, about that but the mountain teaches us this is when it's time to go harvest huckleberries. Doesn't, uh, we don't look at our watches. We don't look at a calendar. Nature tells us when it's ready. And then here is a picture of a huckleberry right here. Very small, amazing huckleberries. I, uh, I, hope, you get to, I hope you get to taste them. My favorite is huckleberry pie. So this is just one small example of how knowledge is um, is taken from from nature. The next is taking a look at symbiosis, and um, symbiosis. We depend on the world. The world depends on people. Uh, there's a respectful balance that give and take and give and take. Um, when one person or one entity gives too much, then there's an imbalance same way somebody takes too much and so there is that respectful balance and then there are consequences for imbalance and i think that we're seeing those consequences right now um, with our global climate so that is symbiosis but it's a bit more than that i found this video from northwest treaty tribes that talks about their habitat strategy and um, you'll need to listen carefully to the video uh, and it's not very long at all, but just listen to what our speaker has to say. And I'm gonna cut there because I forgot to check the speakers. Sorry about that. Picking up the lesson. <clears throat> okay. So in, um, I'm going to show you a short video uh, from a citizen of the Squaxin Island tribe, and she is going to explain to you the relationship uh, that that her people have with uh, with the land around them. My name is Charlene Kreis. I am a Squaxin Island tribal member. My people have lived here for thousands of years. Here within the Northwest, our people, but we have a teaching called Quetzalit. It's a teaching that is very ancient. It connects us to the land, to the water, the watersheds, the animals, the creatures of the land. Our people have always believed that we have a responsibility as people that live here on the land. Today, we're modern people and we have all these laws that we abide by. Our ancient people also understood there's these laws in the land that we need to really pay attention to. 
and the laws of the land remind us as humans that we are vulnerable to whatever happens to the land is going to happen to us. So do you see how she talks about that symbiotic relationship? There is that sacred trust. There is that responsibility. <clears throat> And, um, and so what she's also talking about is stewardship, that there is this sacred responsibility. Uh, and she was talking about all of the lessons and all of the rules and all of the laws that come from the land. And that means that there is that sacred responsibility, that, um, that there is something different I mentioned earlier, that there's always the consideration of future generations versus what we want right here in the now and in the present. Um, that there is always, um, always a goal of balance between living things and environments, and that we work toward the benefit of everyone, native, non-native, all living things, Sinwiki, all, all life on earth, right? And so what I'm going to share with you next is a little bit longer of a video, but I would really, really hope that you would find this on YouTube. Um, it is... Uh, Naimuni Connecting Oxbow Conservation Area. So this is uh, a video that was produced by, Puget, uh, by um, I think, the Bonneville Power Administration and Warm, Spring, Warm Springs Tribe. Remember um, earlier with the tribal, uh, the tribal map of Washington, how I, sh I talked about how, you know, the barriers are, or the borders for tribes were artificially made? Well, that's especially true when we take a look at Columbia River tribes because Warm Springs didn't just stay on the south side of, of the Columbia River where they reside now in Oregon. The same with other tribes, Umatilla, Yakima. And so, um, and so when we're taking a look at Washington state history and we're taking a look at, at our role in history, both tribal and non-tribal, you have to take a look at the, the the territory that we now call Washington and Oregon because because they weren't separated by the river. That's all artificial and, and quite new. And so this um, this talks about Warm Springs and other tribes, including the Yakima. I did see a Yakima tribal member in the video that um, talk about more of that sacred trust and that responsibility and that connection to the land so that the land is definitely more than just real estate. So watch just a part of this video. In 2001, the tribes acquired this property with funding from the Bonneville Power Administration. Their goals for this land are to make it ecologically healthy and to have all the native animals and plants come back and be healthy. When we do something, it's not just, not only for the tribes, but for the local people and the way the fish migrate to. The Confederate tribe of Orangeburgs do a lot of work enhancing the salmon runs just for that purpose. Our children is our most valuable resources, and we want them to have what our elders passed on to us. It benefits the Warm Springs tribe and the other tribes, but it also improves recreational fishing opportunities, which helps the economy of these local rural areas. So I'm going to stop there, but um, I hope that you caught in the video that they're talking about children and um, and preserving and restoring habitat for, for the children for the future. And um, every tribe considers children their most valuable resource. We also saw that uh, in restoring the habitat here along the John Day that, um, that the benefit isn't strictly tribal, that the benefit is for everyone. And I hear that over and over again, the more that I travel, the more that I read, the more that I watch is that the, it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter your last name. It doesn't matter uh, where you were raised or born is that if you are here, tribal people in their generosity are doing this work for everyone, not just for themselves. 
So I hope that you um, get a better, clearer idea of what it means to be a land-based people because we have so much tied up in the land, so much connection to the land that it's not just renting an apartment, buying a house or moving from place to place, that it is much, much more than that. And when we understand that and when we realize that as we move forward studying Washington state history, then you are better, we are able to better understand the impact of all of the development that, um, that Washington state has had uh, since, since settlement in the, um, in the early 1800s. The people who have been here since time immemorial have, um, have a link to the land unlike, unlike any other because to, uh, to traditional way of thinking, we were created here. And so this land was created for us. And so to review, taking a look at land-based values Humans are part of the ecosystem. The creator commands them to be stewards. Worldview protects and manages the environment and focuses on the future. Whereas uh, Judeo-Christian land values, um, humans control the ecosystem. God commands them to conquer the land, to exploit the environment, and the focus is on the here and now, what we can get now, what we can get in the um, in the present. And so that brings us then to the land-based principles that we have. And again, we're taking a look at relationship, how we define relationships, knowledge, what the, what the land teaches us, symbiosis, what we give each other, land and people, in a balanced relationship and then also that stewardship that that relationship and that um, and that covenant that sacred promise requires and so i hope that you can think about in your own in your own head um, the difference between land-based value people and non-land-based values people and so in the packet that i showed you earlier there were just a couple of pages but I wanted you to take a look. So we have the vocabulary there, the two ways of seeing the world, and then a graphic or organizer. You can easily, easily do this on the, um, on the piece of paper that, that you have. But basically I'm asking you to find examples of land-based and Judeo-Christian land values around you. Find them, list them, where do you see them? You're gonna find now that you understand a little bit more that you will be able to see those in your own environment, in your own surroundings, in your own neighborhood, in the news. And then I want you to take a deeper look at your own values. What are your land, land values? What is it that you hope for for your future? Are you worried about the here and now? Are you worried about people that you will never ever meet because they will be going, or because it'll be so far in the future that your efforts benefit them? I find that concept um, almost so hard to conceive because, because land-based people work to benefit people they will never, ever, ever know or meet. And so um, please reflect on your thinking at the beginning of this lesson. Remember, you, um, you started taking a look at what your land values were, at least at the beginning. Um, did you want to dominate the environment or did you want to be part of the environment? And then the last thing that I want you to think about then is the question that you now can answer, which is, is land just real estate to land-based peoples? And I think that you can, can conceive of and write or explain to somebody else the answer to that question. So I appreciate your thinking. I appreciate your listening. I appreciate you doing the activities if you choose. And I also want to tell you what's coming up next time. Next time, we're gonna be talking about the four tribal regions that we have in the Northwest. Now, in elementary school, you were probably told there was coastal and plateau. Well, that's just too simple and, um, and, and insufficient definition of the culture groups 
around the Pacific Northwest. There are actually four that we're going to explore and then we're gonna take a look at how those four groups, um, how their seasonal rounds, and I'll explain next time what that is, how their seasonal rounds reflect land-based principles and practices. So until then, I thank you for listening. I thank you for um, going on this journey with me. And uh, I hope that you come back to learn more about the land beneath our feet. Thank you so much.